Okay, here we're going to take a little digression. The text says, and they wondered after the one, all, all the inhabitants of the world. See, this is all the inhabitants of the world. You have to sort of read it reverse. Wondered, and this is this is a positive version of wondered. Okay, we're amazed. It's again Thalmazo. See, so you got you had to set up with John saying he wondered. The angel saying, "Why are you why are you so shocked? Shock would be a better word for translate this." And I was shocked. Angel's now saying, "Why were you shocked?" And now we got. The next advance on the idea. The whole world is shocked. All the inhabitants of the world are shocked. Okay. At the beast. By the time he gets to the end of the phrase. It's, it's very much in weird word order for Greek. Greek doesn't actually require any particular word order. But when it does tend to have a certain pattern. And... It's very clearly he's measuring the syllables in order to get to certain counts. This is our first indication of what count he's trying to get to. 403 is the syllable count at this point. With the wondering of the world at, we don't, you know, technically speaking, we don't know yet at what. 403 plus 88 is 491 AD. Now, that's 491 from when we say Christ was born okay but we got a three-year problem about him being born like at the end of 3 BC some try to make it a different year the reason we have that three-year problem is there was a guy in Rome named Varro who decided that Rome was 753 years old in the very year that Christ was born not with reference to Christ but just that was the year in which this was this came up and Augustus approved that date that age of Rome at the time so all of our modern historians measure BC and AD that way they weren't the first to do it but they do it the same way based on something that the official dating mechanism is called ab urbe condita from the foundation of and means Rome Livy who was also living at the same time of our, as Varro said no Rome was only 750 years old in that same year that they were debating this which happens to be the year in which Christ was born so when the biblical scholar and the biblical writers are writing this they're sometimes referencing the Livy date and they're sometimes referencing the um, Varro date because the Varro date became law under Claudius. Like Paul's writing references the Varro date. And so he makes a satire out of it because there's a three year difference also in Scripture. Christ was supposed to be born three years later than he was. He ends up being three years born three years earlier than originally scheduled because Solomon spent three years building his own stuff before he started building the temple he was supposed to start building the temple the year David died but he dallied for three years and that's all in 1 Kings 6 1 I've covered that in my how God orchestrates time videos okay so there's a genuine three-year differential even when you look at scripture alone that is like well how do we account for this and of course you're poor stupid scholars not all scholars are stupid, but so far, none of them have realized, oh, wait a minute, there's two timelines. Yeah, because Christ was supposed to be born 2,000 years after Jacob. That would have been 4106 from Adam's fall. But since we aren't accounting Genesis right, and we aren't accounting the Genesis 5 begats right, and we aren't using solar years... We just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, there's a three-year difference. And we also don't take into account the difference between Varro and Livy. So our scheduling and our dates for all this stuff are screwed up. They're less screwed up than they should be. So kudos to the scholars for that. But in any event, 
for what we call 491 AD is something that is according is is has its sort of reflection in what John is doing here because now he's taking into account the Varro calendar and before the beginning of the 491st year after Christ was born on the Varro calendar which really isn't the 491st year after he was born he was three years old when the Varro calendar starts okay but he's taking that into account because people had Varro was the legal calendar okay and so what he's doing is he's tagging from Christ's birth and you'd still get the same result 491 years after he was born if you use the Livy calendar and, and treated Christ dying at 33 you would still get the same basic result okay because you then be subtracting the 33 from the 303 and then you'd be you know adding to get the right year okay it, because you'd be using 750 as Abu Big Kondita using Livy okay but w you wouldn't be calling it by our same term but it would be the same year that's the point so what he's trying to do now is he's using Paul's convention that's what he's tying to is Paul because Paul uses Varro also if there's a 490 of promise time beginning at Christ's birth he's saying okay what in the future will be true as of that date because that would be a memorable year people would pay attention to they would be looking for something portentous to happen that year because something portentous happens at the, ever, at the end of every 490 ever since Adam fell well here it is and everybody's going to be shocked. All the inhabitants of the earth are going to be shocked. Now this is still talking about the real tribulation. But it's trying to explain what these terms that you see here are going to mean by reference to past times where it was similar. Okay? So at the end of 490, 490 AD, okay, what was going on? Well, Rome had fallen, Western Rome had fallen, and you had only the East. And oh, they were so proud of themselves because they were the only Rome standing. And it was just vicious. Vicious. Again, Council of Chalcedon had proceeded and they got their way, so now they're all full of themselves. And then if you look up here, you, and you keep on reading, it goes past 434 AD to show you the Theodosian Code and all the other stuff that, that happened with independent links you can look up. Or you can just go on Wiki and say, well, what was 490 AD like? It was bad. And they were all enamored of the Roman Empire that remained in the East. Because there's no more competition, see? It's really violent. So, at the end of the 490, and see, every 490 ends like this. Every 490 ends in apostasy. Ever since Adam fell. That's why the flood occurred. And I did genius.xls worksheet. If you haven't seen it already, go see it. Because I mapped it out. And, you know, you, you can edit it. So you can add in more events than I added in. And check it yourself with history yourself. Okay? Every 490 years, mankind gets so religified. And so, therefore, apostate, that there has to be a cleaning of house, and therefore there's a lot of fighting, and a lot of civil warring, and a lot of um, uh, death, migration. And each 490 is worse than the prior one. That's the way it's always gone. So the people are all enamored of a big empire. Now, that's a sign of apostasy. What is empire? I mean, seriously. Oh, we're part of a big country. We're important because we're part of a big country that rules over a lot of people, never mind if it rules well and moral or not. It's just big. Well, if that isn't apostasy, I don't know what is. If that isn't, you know, a nation ready for destruction, I don't know what is. That's kind of the way we think now in the United States. It's not good. All right? So the biggest point, though, was for him to tie, because all the writers tie to the benchmark 490. And so this is, this is um, 
John's way of doing it because he's riding an 88 AD and it's not an easy way to tie. So he makes sure he has a longer clause than he has been. See, because most of these clauses, except for this one, have been short. He makes sure he gets this one to get to the 490. So that you have a benchmark of historical trends that characterize the 490. Wait a minute. <coughs> I took my medicine, but it hasn't kicked in yet. All right, so now we're, we're going to get short. Eight syllables, not seven, eight. Tonoma. People who are not written, whose name is not written. And then the next phrase says, into the book of life. You'll see this in Revelation 20. Now, you have to go through the whole Bible to understand how this works. If you ever, everybody at birth is written in the book of life. Okay, and you find this out, well, you have to go pan Bible to find it. It, the first time this is talked about is, is Moses saying to God, Oh, please defend the Jews, otherwise blot me out of your book of life. That's the first time it's used. Moses asking to be blotted out. The word blot out, exalepo in the Greek. I forget what the word is in Hebrew. Um, it means that everybody is in it, but can be blotted out. Well, what would get you blotted out? if you don't believe in Christ through your whole life. Moses is asking to be blotted out because he knows he's in it because he's believed. He did what what Abraham did, Genesis 15, 6. And Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account as righteousness. You believe Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Abraham didn't know his name Jesus Christ, as far as I can tell. But he knew what he was going to do and he believed it. It's always been faith in Christ, the Old or New Testament. Moses did the same thing. So his name, Tonoma, is not blotted out of the book of life because he believed. Now, it has to be blotted out. If you're born, you know, you have a baby, and the baby dies when he's two months old. The baby's going automatically to heaven. It's not blotted out because did the baby have a chance to say no to the gospel? No. That's why D David says, and I want to say it somewhere in 2 Samuel 7, but it might be elsewhere. David says, when his son dies, and you can Google on this, I will go to him. He will not go to me. In other words, his son is in heaven, and he, when he dies, he's going to go to heaven. Well, actually, what would eventually be heaven. But his son was already saved, even though his son died like eight days after he was born. Okay, that's the point. You're in the book of life at birth. You get blotted out if you never believe in Christ. Concerning sin, what is it? Concerning sin because they don't believe in me, John 16, 9. You have to be blotted out. So all the people who are never going to believe in Christ, prophetically, during the tribulation, are going to be all excited about all the inhabitants of the earth who are not written, whose names are not written, in the book of life. Yeah, you're not there anymore because you got blotted out because you never believed in Christ. They are going to be just enamored. They're going to be shocked and happy. All these inhabitants of the earth. At the beast. When they see the beast that was. In other words, all this BS about the revival of Rome and the existence of Rome the people who don't belong to Christ are excited about it. Now, I hate to say this, but people are excited about it right now around Donald Trump. They call themselves Seven Mountains, which I haven't gotten to the Seven Mountains yet, but I will. And they reverse the entire chapter of Revelation 17. Reverse it. As we saw... Constantine builds New Rome. We haven't seen the Seven Mountains yet because that's coming later. But that's what New Rome was. It was Rome's own name for itself was the Seven Seven Hills. Okay, that stood for the seven patriarchal families of, you know, Rome in Italy, 
and the idea was if you lived on those hills you were better than everybody else it's kind of a stupid idea Constantine recreated those same seven hills in what we call Istanbul today back in 330 he dedicated it back in 326 he started it so the idea of Rome having fallen and coming back again Oh, when they see the beast that was, but it is again. Oh, we're so excited. Yeah, if you're too dumb to live. And you'll be too dumb to live if you turn down Christ. Because, hi, honey, how can you turn down a free gift like this? You just believe he paid for your sins and you're saved. And you say, well, that's too easy. It wasn't too easy for him. When you inherit something, it's easy on you, but it wasn't easy on the person who accumulated the money. Was well, it better money? All right, and you can't pay for your own sins before Holy God. You can't do it. So you believe He did it, or you try to do it yourself. Well, they're going to try and do it themselves, and therefore they're thalmazo of uh, over the beast, this big empire with all its pretty buildings. Yeah when he gets to that point all right that's 526 now between 491 and 526 is exactly what's being described here is everybody wanting some big empire and now we have the big battles between the Byzantine Empire and the Persians and they're all wandering after their own particular beast. The Persians have the Persian beast, and the Byzantines have the Byzantine beast. And my beast is better than your beast, so let's go fight each other. And of course, they fight in Jerusalem. They're fighting in Anatolia also. They're fighting in the Tigris and Euphrates River also. They're fighting in Egypt also. But of course, Jerusalem is right in the middle of all those can't go to Egypt without going through Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is caught in the crosshairs and this is exactly where Christ times his prophecy. When he says the you know Matthew 24 when he says learn the parable of the fig tree and it puts out its leaves you know that the door is near the door to your you know the door of the, this horrible stuff that he's all telling you. Yeah. If you were in Jerusalem in those days, honey, this was a bad time to be there. Really bad time to be there. And besides that, the Byzantines were there until the Persians would take them over. And then the Byzantines would win the territory back. And then the Persians would win the territory back, back and forth, back and forth. Who's the bigger beast? When the Persians were there, the Jews had something of a respite. When the Byzantines were there, uh-uh. And of course, if you were Christian and you were in the Jerusalem or Middle Eastern area during these times, again, if the Byzantines were there, you weren't you weren't at all safe because there was a big argument going on amongst the rulers of Byzantine. What version of Christianity is really the right one? And if you didn't belong to theirs, then they killed you, or they did something else nasty to you. And it was a real problem, especially in the Middle East. Because the Middle East didn't go along with, depending on what side they were on, didn't go along with middle with Byzantine Christianity. And sometimes Byzantine Christianity was nice to the people in the Middle East, and sometimes it wasn't, depending on where they were fighting with the Persians. But for the most part, they were pretty negative. Okay? Really pretty negative. Now, so what he's doing here when he gets to 438, besides tagging beasts, Okay. 526 is when Justin 1 dies. So, there we go again. Was. Hain. The beast that was. Yeah, the beast that was just died. His name was Justin 1. Technically, he dies August 527. Okay, but John is writing in December. Eh. Do you round it down? Do you round it up? If you round it up, oh, well, then here's another Kai. If we say, okay, well, it's really 527, even though he's writing from December, because, I mean, that is eight months later. All right, great. So now we have another Kai. Another emperor who 
in Latin you call him Kaiser. He's just Kai. He's just the connector. See how predictable this is? You see, they're timing the syllables for these deaths that occur in the future. This has to be God. Only God knows the future. Okay? And if, if John knew it when he was writing down, or the angel knew it, and explained it to him, well, that's the only way that the angel would know. I mean, this is really biting. You can say he was by rounding it to 526 maybe he was sick for a long time I don't believe that was true or you say okay well it's really 527 okay so he's Kai he was Kaiser but he was Kaiser he's now just Kai see how biting that is now the other thing that's remarkable about this is the very word beast and what I haven't shown you is that each one of these words highlighted in green is actually referring also to a specific point of time that's referring to a particular event of extra satirical quality. Okay, to help you understand this text better. And as you go through those years in the text, you find out better what, it, what it's talking about. Because what is it talking about? It's talking about unity of church and state. That's the horror. Unity of church and state. So this particular one is at verse 8. And you'll notice it starts at the beginning. It's like a bookend. Beginning of verse 8. Of course they didn't use verse numbers. But it's still it's still like a little paragraph syntactically. And at the end. Alright. So here we go. Beast. Here are all your beast references. Here's 8b. And it's specifically talking about 520 to 520. 23 AD. Now why does that matter? Because it's 400 years after the cross. And Matthew 24 had benchmarked 490 years after the cross. So he's tagging. He's tagging Matthew 24. At the 490 meter in Matthew 24. Which has learned the parable of the fig tree. Now what was going on in 520? Okay. In 520, one of the things that was going on in Jerusalem at the time is the so-called Byzantine Patriarch of Jerusalem he got it into his head that he was going to build an altar, a temple to Mary as the Mother of God on top of the Holy of Holies. Oh, I'm sorry. When he talks about um, the 490 at, at Matthew... He's talking about the, the abomination. When you see the abomination, the fig tree parable comes at, at uh, 1050. Christ in Matthew 24 is saying, when you see the abomination, Delugma, we saw up here three times or twice. See? Delugma there for Constantine, signifying Constantine, and Delugma signifying um Diocletian, so it's a pretty bald tie. So when he comes down here, he's tying to 520 at the beast. So you had two abominations, now a beast. Okay, but when you look at the Matthew text, it's still talking delugma. It's using the same keyword as up here. So the beast is a synonym for abomination. And what was the abomination? Oh, the patriarch of Jerusalem decided and got it into his head that on top of the Holy of Holies that was supposed to be about Christ, he's instead going to build himself a temple to Mary. Now, I don't know if it gets more abominating than that. Mother of harlots. That's not Mary's fault. That's them making a cult out of her, which started with our dear girl, Polkaria. That's the Mary Theotokos cult got started with her. Okay, but that was over a hundred years prior. What's their excuse now? She's been dead. Well, because they like the cult and they're going to make a beast out of it. They're going to make a whole political entity out of it. And the Patriarch of Jerusalem in 520, which is when these 520, 523, he's going to create a temple to Mary 
They call it the Nea Theotakos. You can even Google on it. That's how I learned of it. It's starting in 520. And by 526, when Justin One dies, the next guy who comes to the fore at the Kai, the next Kai instead of a Kaiser, is Justinian the First. One of the most vile guys ever to be on the throne. And he undertakes to complete the building that got started here in 520. Only seven years later that he starts to do that. And he builds a whole big temple atop the Holy of Holies. And yet he's the guy who wrote the Justinian Code. He was the guy who was supposed to be such a great jurist. And so educated. Well, he must hate God then. How can you be so stupid about the Bible that atop the Holy of Holies, which they knew it was the Holy of Holies, why would you build a temple to Mary on top of the Holy of Holies that was dedicated to Christ? Why would you do that? You have to hate God or be insane or be demonic. Take your pick. Okay, so the old Kai dies and the new Kai comes and they both think they're Kaisers, but they're just connectors. And this is our second poster boy. The first one was Constantine, and we finished his aftermath. And we've seen that as a result of Constantine, the empire splits. And now Justinian is going to try and revive Rome. So now see the aptness of the text. They're staring at the beast that was, and is not, and will appear. Yeah. That's exactly what Justinian tries to do. Make it reappear. That's his whole goal. It ends up it ends up pretty much destroying the Byzantine Empire, but it takes another 500 years before it actually goes down. That's what Justinian wants to do. And he goes to war, 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 and he recaptures territory, and he recaptures territory, and he practically bankrupts the empire doing it. And he thinks, well, I'm Kaiser. I'm doing God's will. I'm doing God's work. Okay? That's when he comes to power. That's when Justin I dies and Justinian I takes place. Actually, Justinian I was pretty much effectively a ruler, a ruler several years before Justin I dies. He's like, he was like, I don't know, 25. Real pistol. Okay? So, here's what, it, what then notice this, it, and will appear. So that's covering from 530 to 534. Only four more years. What happens during those four years? Oh, as soon as Justinian I comes to power, there's suddenly a lot of bad weather, it's cold, there's famine in the, 19, in the 530s, and there's fighting in Italy too. So it ain't so easy for him to reconquer as he thinks. Oh, but it gets worse. And then what about the next 10 years? That ends 544. Well, by the 544, from 542 and following, you have what the people of Constantinople called the Plague of Justinian. And modern scholars think it was an early version of the bubonic plague. Justinian himself caught it. But he didn't die from it. Okay? And what is what is the, the text for this time? Oh, here, this calls for a voice that has wisdom, for a mind of wisdom. Well, our boy didn't have any, but some of the people did. Ah, it's Justinian's fault that we got this plague. Yeah. As they always do, they brought it back from all their wars in the East. The plagues usually started in China. And then the, those people traveled toward the east. And then when soldiers went to the east, they'd pick up the carrier germs, which were really from rats. But not necessarily only from rats. And they'd bring it back with them to Rome or Byzantine or wherever they went. The same thing happened under Aurelius. The same thing happened under Ananias Pius. They even called it the, the plague in 165. 
Okay, but it's not necessarily the same version of the plague. It wasn't necessarily bubonic. Okay? And long before that, back in 534, you had all this bad weather and stuff. And before that, you had the Nika revolt, which were the people of Constantinople, of the Blues Hippodrome team, and the Greens, who were usually at each other's throats, but... Justinian or somebody did something that they didn't like and they blamed Justinian for it and he almost had to leave but his wife who was sort of courtesan named Theodora she refused to leave and so they had a brutal showdown instead and Belisarius shut them all up into the Hippodrome and killed 30,000 of them in the Hippodrome I mean this is the kind of brutality that was living in those days and will come. Yeah, the beast will come all right with the Nika revolt and bad weather and cold and famine all in the person of Justinian the first. And I don't, you know, whether he married a courtesan or not is really quite beside the point. She was actually pretty smart. She dies of cancer, however, in this next increment during the next 12 years. She dies in 548. But meanwhile, four years prior, there was already a plague and there were more famines during this time. So yeah, it calls for a mind with wisdom because, hi, you want the beast that was to come again? And you're all excited. All the people of the earth are all excited. At the, even because their names aren't written in the Book of Life because they never believe in Christ. They're wondering at the beast that was. Okay, but you can still, if you, if you are not written in the book, because you're never going to believe in Christ. What about those people who did believe once in Christ and then just went retarded afterwards? Just spit on Christ afterwards. What do you think it's going to be like for them? They're going to be all glorifying the beast too. They just happen to be saved. So if it's true for those who are unsaved, it's going to be also true for those who are saved. But you're not saved because you believe the right thing. You're saved because you believe Christ paid for your sins, and that's a permanent thing. Oh, and he was, he wasn't, he isn't now, but he's coming. And that's what's happening to the Trump people. They're trying to make Rome revive. That's what Justinian was trying to do, and he was probably a believer. He was trying to make Rome revive. What did he revive? Bad weather, cold, famine play a revolt with 30,000 killed in the Hippodrome under Belisarius. You can search all that. You can just find it all up here. Okay. Or you can go into Wiki and look at it. The articles are a lot alike. This one's a better article. It's more pithy, scholarly. Okay. So here's a mind that has wisdom. Okay. Now we get to the seven mountains. Okay? We've gotten to 544, we've gotten to plague. Okay, now we're getting to 556. There was an earthquake that also did a lot of damage to the people of Byzantium. It was in Beirut and it had a wide range. Okay? But see, in 553, Re Esen. See, there's the seven mountains right there. Seven mountains, seven hills, really. See, it says, And the seven heads are the seven mountains. The seven heads are the... He's already introduced the heads, but he never said anything about mountains till now. Are the seven mountains. The seven mountains of what? Eastern Rome. Because there is no Western Rome anymore. There's only one Rome that he can be talking about at this point. And what happened at the A of Hore? Justinian commands the church that anything that gets said as church law, church liturgy, church doctrine, church anything is per Justinian one's command. So, the seven heads are the seven hills, and he's the head of the seven hills. 
and in 553 you can look this up yourself everything that the church everything about church all of its rules, its regulations, its doctrines, anything is subject to Justinian's approval. I don't know if it gets more abominating than that. And where is Justinian? Well, he's in New Rome, which is where the Seven Hills are. Seven Hills are. Now there's a literal seven heads in the tribulation, but there were also seven heads at the time he's doing this, but he's the head of them all. Commander at the seven hills, which is New Rome, which is Byzantium, which is the only seven hills that are extant at that time. So he is the second poster boy. Constantine started the seven hills. Justinian is ruling at the time of this particular passage that talks about the seven hills. He's the only one. There's no rival Rome. There's no other second set of seven hills. And this is the law he makes at the A of Hore. The rule from the seven hills is, yep, that's him. I mean, if that isn't Antichrist, I don't know what is. So had the rapture occurred then, he would have been the Antichrist. And, you know, if he wasn't saved, he would have been the Antichrist. If he was saved, somebody else would have taken his place to do the same thing. See the point? Now watch. Five sixty seven is the next increment. Okay. Justinian dies at the end of five sixty five, which you can verify here. Okay, that's the wiki link. It's got some interesting additional things in it that aren't in the Roman Emperor's link. Just here. So these are two different links for the same person. I do that a lot. Don't just assume when you see the link with the same name that it's the same link. It's usually different. Okay. See, these are not always the same links. Okay, Justinian dies at the end of 565. Where's that? Right here. Epi. Except it's not even the, the I. He's, he's truncated it. Authors get the right to spell out the full word. Or they, they truncate it. So John cuts it off. And that's good Greek. But the point is, is it's, it's got more punch. Because Justinian dies there. Epi. Not even a pawn, just uh, one minute you're there, one minute you're gone. So he's no longer a pawn anything. So all of his approvals and all these things that he thought he was going to do in 553, honey, 12 years after that, he's no longer ruling a pawn church or anything else. Hopefully he went to heaven. And if he did, he's screaming from heaven right now. Yes, 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 Brano, please clarify that I was a bad ruler. Yes, yes, yes. Or anybody else who's talking about it. I have to be talking about him right this second. Because if I was just in here, that's what I'd be doing. You know, don't, don't, don't let people perpetuate the, the lie that I was a good ruler. I wasn't. Yeah, well, hopefully it's not being perpetuated by this mouth. All right. And if this mouth has said anything stupid when I'm dead, I'll be yelling from heaven to somebody else to correct my errors too. Okay? That's how it works. That's how you really are a friend to somebody. Okay, 479, though, has a yet another special meaning like this did. This was 490 from Christ's death. This is taking into account the fact that John is writing in 88 A.D., and the rapture, they were all expecting it to have happened the year before he writes. So they're expecting the millennium to be six years from when he writes. And if you count back from the beginning of the year from when he writes, although he's writing at the end of the year, then 567 A.D. would result, which would be the 70-year voting period after 490 A.D. up here. So he is tracking his syllable counts to the same benchmarks that have been used ever since Moses. Moses uses these benchmarks first. 
is 490 plus 70 plus 490. Moses uses them first in Genesis 1 and in Psalm 90. And I did the videos on that in Vimeo. You can just look up Psalm 90 channel in Vimeo. And you can look up the Genesis X Edge channel in Vimeo. And you'll see all the, you can just sit back and watch all the many hours of videos and, you know, be a masochist. But it goes through this, this whole timing thing. Or just look at the How God Orchestrates Time Playlist in Vimeo, which has all the, the necessary links to all the other material. Okay? John is tracking the same 490, 70 plus 490 voting period that 560 would normally entail. But he's writing seven years before the new 490 would begin had there been no church. So he's got to reconcile it. That's exactly what Matthew 24 did in its syllable counts. Exactly what um, Luke 21 does in its syllable counts. Exactly what Mark 13 did in its syllable count. So it's the same convention. And therefore, again, he's letting you know, Hi, I'm tagging Matthew 24, I'm tagging Luke 21, and I'm tagging Mark 13 because they all have the same style. It's, it's like when you when anybody quotes something that Trump says, you know, sad. And somebody says, oh, sad. Everybody knows that's part of a Trump tweet. You don't even have to explain it. Okay, well, to the Greek reader who wouldn't see this in 88 AD when John wrote, he wouldn't even need this to be explained. He'd know right away, oh yeah, seven years under the old tree preacher schedule, and then 560 years after that, yeah. And, you know, he'd understand that. Okay, but to us, thousands of years later, we don't, because our parents didn't pass it on. Okay, but the Bible preserved it, as you can see here. Okay. So after that, it's like, oh, the woman is sitting on the beast. Yeah, well, but Justinian isn't sitting upon anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now there's a new beast. The, the beast gets a new rider, and his name is Justin the Second. Oh, goody. But it, it doesn't happen quite a way, right away. There's this sort of like musical chairs emperor thing. Okay, over what woman will be sitting on the beast, and sometimes it actually is a woman that's involved in the fight. And I'll let you look that up between 567 and, 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 and 575. There's a little bit of a fight, but pretty early on, Justin II, who's a sort of, I don't know, what do you want to call it, cousin of Justin I. All right, because Justin Justinian d didn't have any kids. That's always a big, scary point. Justin the second ends up being sort of like a close relative, and he ends up coming to power, and he ends up being insane. And sometimes he knows he's insane, and sometimes he doesn't know he's insane. And what he's trying to do is he's all fixated on being just like Justinian, but he's not. Thank God. Okay, so see, so look at this. This is 567. Alright. And this is Kai. Now when did Justinian come to power? Let's see. He came to power, oh, right away. He came to power right away. As soon as we see Justinian died late in 565. Okay. So Justinian died late in 565. Alright, so our boy comes right away on the heels up. Alright, so so we got F. No, oh, we got Alton in the middle, so it's not quite a Kai. Alright, so at Ow, Justin II takes over. Or maybe you can say it's F since it was in November of 565. Just after Justinian died. So, Justinian is no longer upon anything, but now Justin II is upon, is riding upon the woman. Yep, that was his big problem. And guess what his wife's name was? <laughs> Sophia. What did it say up here? Here, it calls for a, a mind of Sophia. Yeah, and his wife's name was Sophia, which means wisdom. She didn't have very much wisdom. She sort of helped him 
kill enemies he didn't like. But in the end, she ended up having a good role because she convinced him, Hi, Justin, you're, you're my husband and I love you, but you're nuts. Retire. So in 574, he's going to retire. And what is that? Ice. Or I. I, 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 A, 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 Kings 7 R. Well, not him. He's not one of the seven anymore. But get this. When you go to look at the aftermath of what happens when he retires at the I, the A, there are seven that follow. Okay? There's seven that follow, and it's kind of like musical chairs. Okay, so I'll let you go look that up. You go look up just in a second. That's the Wikipedia article. And you go look up Justinian. And I'll see you in the next increment.